All right. <clears throat> now, in the in we're Mark. I want to. We're in chapter nine. I want to get you back up to where where we're, what we're talking about. In in Mark chapter nine, verses thirty to thirty-two, Jesus and the disciples they're in Galilee. They're heading for Capernaum, and Jesus again tells the disciples that he will be killed and will be raised after three days. Meaning, in Jewish usage, he's going to be raised on the third day. And when they arrive at the house in Capernaum, which is probably Peter's house, Jesus asks them what they're arguing about on the way, but they don't answer him because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. And they knew that Jesus wouldn't really be pleased with that. And then in 933 to 37, Jesus, who obviously knows what they were arguing about, he teaches them a shockingly countercultural truth. That greatness in the kingdom of God, it, it lies not in social rank or status, the kind of greatness about which they were arguing, but rather it lies in making oneself a servant of others and taking this lower position of a servant. You see, in a, in a culture that was very uh, socially conscious about rank and hierarchy, so he then comes and tells them, no, that, that you need not to be like that. That's not something that is, uh, you're here arguing about who's the greatest. You need to be the servant. You need to be willing to take the position of lowest rank and not allow rank or status to be an impediment to your serving. So that, no, 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 I only serve upstream people who are above me in rank. No, 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 you're to become a servant. You see, take that lower position. And he illustrates that point by taking a little child in the house into his arms. And as I explained, little children in the ancient world, they had no social status. Like in our culture, we seem to make them, you know, the, they were certainly loved. Okay, that's obvious. Children are loved by their parents. But in terms of the social order, they had no social status. You know, many years ago, that we would say to children, they're to be seen and not heard. Okay, so you see, that, th this idea that in the ancient world, they weren't considered socially important. And so they were, they were there with no social status whatsoever, and, and they weren't significant. And so Jesus, in receiving or welcoming this small child, especially in a gathering of adult males. He brings this child in. He thereby, he breaks this social boundary, this social barrier, and he demonstrates that the disciples, they cannot be enamored with rank or status so as to allow that to impede their serving other people. So this is what he's doing in receiving this low-ranking child. He's saying, listen, you can't allow that to be a barrier. Disciples have to be willing to put themselves in the position of the lowly servant. And having made that point, he then uses the child as a representative of his disciples, those cross bearers, see, who've embraced a path of no social status, a path of rejection and scorn. And he says that those who receive the disciples, because they're his disciples, that they in that receive him, and in receiving him, they receive God the Father. So this is what he said. And then in 938, you see the disciples, the apostles' desire for status or social elevation, it comes in a different guise here. And that's where we left off, and that's what I want to talk about. It comes in a different guise their desire, in their encounter with this unknown exorcist. So here, they see one, the disciples, they encounter this unknown exorcist, this one who was casting out demons in Jesus' name. And as John reports the situation to Jesus, they told this exorcist to stop his activity because he was not following us. They told him to stop because he was not following us. The stated rationale for stopping him wasn't 
that they were not following Jesus. He was not following Jesus. It wasn't that he was misrepresenting Jesus or that he was misrepresenting the kingdom of God, but that he was not affiliated with them. He was not affiliated with the apostolic team. And it seems likely that this person was a follower of Jesus, but somebody outside the apostolic circle. Perhaps he was one of the 72 Jesus had sent out, as reported in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 17. And as a free agent, so to speak, as a free agent, his work wouldn't contribute to the reputation of the apostles and in fact it might detract from that reputation and so here you see them they say he, he's not one of us so we told him to stop and Jesus first gives a pragmatic reason for them not to stop the exorcist they shouldn't have stopped him because in doing miracles in Jesus name he says that will preclude him from quickly turning around and then speaking evil of me so there's this pragmatic reason. This person would be slow to speak evil of Jesus because he'd look like a fool for having been out here with his wagon hooked to Jesus, identifying with Jesus, and then all of a sudden turning around and speaking evil of Jesus. I mean, you see how people, how reluctant people are to criticize politicians after they've come out in support of them, right? Once they're out there, I mean, a politician cut somebody's head off. And then they're still sitting there. Oh, no, 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 they don't want, don't want to see. So that's the idea. It's a pragmatic reason. Look, he's out there in my name doing these things. So he will be very reluctant to turn around and in the next minute say something evil about me. But Jesus' second reason why they shouldn't have done this is expressed in a proverb. He says, whoever's not against us is for us. Now, as you know, proverbs are not absolute truths. Proverbs are situationally specific. For example, in Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5, it says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Answer not a fool according to his folly. Answer a fool according to his folly. You see, there are times and circumstances when it's wise to ignore a fool. And there are times and circumstances when it's wise to engage a fool. And part of wisdom is being able to tell the difference. You see, part of wisdom is knowing when does this particular proverb apply. That's why it says, you know, a proverb in the mouth of a fool is worthless. You see, so there, there's wisdom in saying, what is the season for the application of what proverb? And so here, this proverb applies to the situation at hand where the disciples, they're more focused on protecting their status and authority than on Christ being glorified and his kingdom bringing activity being manifested through the work of this exorcist. That's not their concern. They're more concerned about their status and authority. So that's a case of whoever's not against us, whoever's not against us is for us. In other cases, such as when people are hesitating to commit to Jesus, the reverse proverb. That's given in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30 would apply. Whoever's not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Okay, so here's a situation for the proverb that Jesus quotes. Now, this whole situation where they're concerned about these, this exorcist who's not one of them, and they put a stop to him, it's reminiscent of what you see in Numbers chapter 11, verses 26 to 30. Where Joshua asked Moses to put a stop to Eldad and Medad prophesying inside the camp. And Moses said there in verse 29, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So you see this same kind of idea of this somehow is diminishing, diminishing me 
in my uniqueness if I've got somebody else out here doing this. And then in 941 and 42, Jesus instructs about those who aid and who harm his disciples, those who embrace Jesus. See, those who embrace Jesus as reflected in their giving a cup of water to the disciples because they belong to Christ. You see, so if I'm giving a cup of water to somebody because he belongs to Christ, that's indicative of my embrace of Jesus. Those who do that will certainly not lose their reward. They will enter into eternal life. And that teaching, it's paralleled, by the way, in the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Jesus is not saying that charity per se will be rewarded. And that's sometimes how people read it, even people in the church. He's not saying that charity per se will be rewarded. He's saying Christian faith. Christian faith which expresses itself in mercy toward fellow believers. Yes, other people too. But he's focused here on fellow believers. Certainly, Christian faith expresses itself in mercy toward brothers and sisters. Well, that Christian faith will be rewarded. But those who reject Jesus as reflected in their causing those who believe in him to stumble, they're enemies. They're hostile. They're pulling people from faith. Those who reject Jesus as reflected in their causing, causing belief, those who believe in him to stumble, see, to experience a spiritual downfall, they will face a divine judgment that's worse than being thrown into the sea with a large millstone around their neck. They're going to be judged. And again, that idea is expressed in the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Then at 43 to 50 of chapter 9, Jesus says here that stumbling, stumbling, you see, coming under God's judgment of hell, that it's so dreadful. That is such a dreadful, awful prospect that somebody should do anything to avoid it. One should cut off one's hand or foot. Or pluck out one's eye if those body parts are the cause of that stumbling. You see, it is such a dreadful prospect that if those things are causing you to stumble, to be consigned to hell, well then you'd be better cutting off your hand, cutting off your foot, plucking out your eye. It's better to enter eternal life. It's better to enter the eternal life of the kingdom of God, maimed, crippled, or with one eye, than to have both hands, both feet, both eyes, and not enter that life. That is, and to be sentenced to hell. It's better to enter maimed and without eyes than to be sentenced to hell. It's that significant. Now, in saying it's better to enter the eternal life of the kingdom of God maimed or one-eyed, Jesus seems to be implying, consistent with some rabbinic teachings or rabbinic understandings, that the dead will initially be raised. Will initially be raised with whatever bodily defects they had at death. Joel Marcus, in his commentary on Mark, he says, these rabbinic traditions go on to affirm that immediately after their resurrection, the disabled will be healed of their disabilities, and the, and the same assumption may underlie our passage. The lame or blind will enter eternal life maimed, but they will not remain in that condition. You see, so I think that's what's going on here with this, with this resurrection life. He's saying that they will be, if you did that, if you were maimed, initially you'll be resurrected and then healed of that. You see, and then that's something that will be taken, will be taken care of. They will not remain in that condition. Now, hell is literally, it's Gehenna, which is this valley on the southern side of Jerusalem. It's that valley that in the intertestamental period, the period between the Old Testament closing and the New Testament, it came to symbolize the place of divine punishment. 
to go there is described in verse 40, 43 as going into the unquenchable fire. And in verse 48, referring to Isaiah 66, 24, it describes it as a place where their, their worm, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It is an eternal punishment. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. It is a sharing in the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In Matthew 25, verse 41. In one of the most sobering passages in all of Scripture, in my judgment, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, it says, The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. Now, this is metaphorical imagery, but it is metaphorical imagery of eternal punishment, eternal sorrow, eternal bummer. Okay? It's a way of picturing that. And I know people try to bleed out of that the eternal punishment aspect by arguing that no, no, what really happens is the wicked are annihilated. I think that's a misunderstanding. I think that that's a misunderstanding and I will in the near future post something that will go into that in more detail. But I just want you to see that what Jesus is saying here. Now Jesus is not advocating, he's not advocating the literal mutilation of one's body, but he's advocating separating from what causes one to sin. This is evident from the fact that the mentioned body parts, they aren't the cause of sin. You remember that old movie, The Hand? You know, this thing had this thing, like Peter Lorre grabbing his hand. That's not how it is. You see, your hand and your foot and your eye, these things are not the causes of sin. As Robert Stein, Stein says, a one-handed, one-footed, one-eyed person can still be tempted sin and thus stumble you see it's simply a way of making a point as Stein said the sayings are a hyperbolic attempt by Jesus and Mark to warn his audience that there is no sin worth going to hell for now that's it there is no sin worth going to hell for now, in your right mind, you know that. But you know how, how sin is. You know how the enemy plays. And we get pulled into certain situations thinking and everything gets really cloudy. And one acts like an insane person. And doesn't understand that there is no sin, you see, that no sin worth going to hell for. Better to repent no matter how painful that repentance may be. Okay, so that if you have some sin that you hold on to, whether you like getting drunk, whether you like getting stoned, whether you like engaging in sexual immorality, whether you like looking at pornography, and we could go on and on with things that are very popular in our culture. You say, I just, I, I don't want to give that up. I would rather keep that secret and have that as my problem. Look, Better to repent, no matter how painful that repentance may be, and follow Jesus, whatever the cost, than to perish in hell. That's the point. It's clear. And you say, well, wow, that's pretty overwhelming. I mean, he really calls for everything. Indeed. <laughs> right. He calls for everything. You know, I mean, that's all over the Bible, isn't it? It's all over. That's how Jesus is. Now, the statement in verse 49, where it says, For everyone will be salted with fire. That seems to indicate that everyone will undergo trials intended to purify or to develop them, as salt could serve a purifying function. You see that, for example, in Ezekiel 16.4 and 43.24. See, in that journey where one is undergoing these trials to be purified or to be developed, one needs to remember in that context what is at stake when one is tempted to sell out for sin. You always have to remember, and that's why, you know, 
there is an aversion in modern culture to speaking of hell. It's like disappeared. Because we don't want people to think that we are toothless people on a porch swing, sitting out here just, you know, that we, we are backward. These fundamentalist people, who they just think about, just talk about hell and all that. But hell has a redemptive purpose. Hell is designed to teach people that it is really, really important that we come and give the Lord our allegiance. You see, and if you drain that away, and the more you airbrush that out, well, the less you have what God has given us to call people. Okay, so it, it's something that is important. Jesus never apologized for it. He never apologized for talking like this. And say, well, I don't want you to think about hell as though that should be any part of your motivation of coming. He's the one who spoke about it more than anybody. So how dare we suggest that there's something somehow improper about telling people the truth. We don't relish it. We're not wishing it on people. We're saying it to get people not to go there. That's what we want. We are emissaries of our Lord. And we are trying to get people not to, not to wind up there. Now the salt in the first part of verse 50, it refers to a different use of salt. You see, salt is, is good in that it functions as a preservative. In the ancient world, that was a huge thing. They didn't have refrigerators. So the fact you could use salt to preserve things and keep them so you could eat them later, well, that was a very positive and beneficial thing. And they also serves to add flavor to food, which I love. <laughs> you see, so that's a positive, beneficial thing. So it has a powerful and positive effect on that to which it is applied. And that is what I think he's talking about there. But if one becomes, if salt becomes unsalty, those benefits are lost because saltiness can't be restored. And what I think the Lord is saying here, he's encouraging the disciples not to abandon discipleship, not to become unsalty, not to lose the beneficial effect, the positive effect of being a disciple in this dark world, the effect that we can have on the world. If you become unsalty, if you fall away, if you cease to be a disciple, to have the qualities of a disciple, well, then you'll be of no value. And I think that's what he's urging him. Then this statement in, in uh, the statement that have salt among yourselves. ESV translates it in yourselves. Have salt among yourselves in the second part of verse 50. That may be a reference to sharing meals together. Have salt among yourselves. See, sharing salt which is sharing meals together is a symbol of fellowship and peace among friends and family. And if that's, on, if that's the right track, you see, then the final clause there, he says, and be at peace with one another, well, that's then a synonymous parallel. You see, that it serves to explain the prior clause. That's what he's talking about. So I think that's, I think that's what's being said there, but that's, that's fairly obscure. Have salt among yourselves. Now, depending on the English translation you're using, you may have noticed that there's a blank in verses 44 and in verses, verses 44 and 46. So you might just have the verse number there and nothing. Like I said, depending on the translation that you're using. They're not printed in most modern translations. And they're not printed in most modern translations because it's very unlikely that they were part of the original text of Mark. Okay, and that's what we're interested in. We're interested in what is what did Mark under inspiration write, not what was added later. And you know the whole science of sect textual criticism, where there are ways to be able fairly confidently in certain cases to say, no, this was something that came later and was added later and then was copied. And so that's why that is, if you, if you saw that when you were looking at the slide there. Now, Matt, in, in chapter 10, 1 to 12, Jesus here teaches on divorce. He leaves Capernaum, 
He leaves Capernaum and he, he goes to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. So he's now out of Galilee. He comes down to Judea and goes beyond the Jordan. And even here, away from Galilee, crowds gather and Jesus teaches them. And some Pharisees come to him. And to test him, they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? This is what they're, they're, they're putting this question to Jesus. Now, the notable debate about divorce in the days of Jesus, there was an ongoing debate, okay, documented, we know this, that this notable debate that was ongoing between two schools of rabbis in the first century, Hillel and Shammai, okay, the Shammites and the Hillelites, there was a debate over the meaning of the indecent thing that's specified in Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 1 as the grounds for divorce. They argued about that. What is the meaning of that indecent thing in Deuteronomy 24 1 that permits a divorce? What is that? Now the Hillelites argued that divorce could be on the grounds of any matter or indecency. And the second, the indecency, was subsumed under any matter. Okay, so it's any matter or indecency. So you can divorce for any matter. That was the Hillelites' case. That was what they argued. The Shamites argued that Deuteronomy 24.1 permitted divorce only for a matter of indecency. You see? So it's not any matter or indecency. So this is obviously covered by any matter. But rather, no, no, no. It's a matter of indecency. So that's the debate. And these Pharisees had this debate going among themselves. See? So, and this idea, the Shamites, they argued, look, you get this thing for any matter. The, 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 no, I'm sorry. The Shamites argue that permitted only for a matter of indecency, which they took to be some serious sexual offense. All right, Hillelites, any matter. Shamites, a, a matter of indecency. Well, what's a matter of indecency? They took that to be a serious sexual offense. And the permissive Hillelite view, any matter, that was the dominant cultural view. That's how most people rolled. Okay, that's, that was the under, how most people lived under that perspective. Now, Mark reports the Pharisees' question. His report of the Pharisees' question, it's meant as a shorthand. When he says here that the Pharisees ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? That's a shorthand. They're asking him whether it's lawful for a man to to divorce his wife for the debated reasons. Do these Pharisees have this ongoing debate? Okay, is it any matter or indecency, or is it a matter of indecency? And so that's what he's asking him. For the debated reasons, is it permissible to get a divorce beyond, for a reason beyond a serious sexual offense? They all agreed on that. Okay? The Shamites agreed serious sexual offense, divorce is okay. The Hillelites, of course, agreed any matter. So they all agreed on that. And what, what is being asked of Jesus here, look, do you agree on these debated reasons? And you can see that that's what they're asking. The parallel in Matthew 19.3 specifies that. Is it lawful to divorce for any reason? That's the very terminology that was used among the Pharisees. Okay, in that debate. So you know that's what they're asking him. They want, they want to stake him to a position in this ongoing debate. Take a stand. We don't want politicians being able to be all things to all people and let everybody read into them what they want. I want to put you on the record. I want you to clearly say which way you go. Now why am I doing that? I'm doing that to test you. Why? What does that mean? I, I'm hoping that in staking you to a position, you're going to alienate some people. 
My motivation in doing this is negative. I want people to fall away from you and to drop you. Even that just means in my own little group. I want people to recognize that you're not the way to go from my perspective. The Pharisees are testing him with that question. As I say, they want to put him on the record here with this. And Jesus asked them what Moses commanded. See, they're coming, is it lawfully? And Jesus asked them what Moses commanded. He's intending to focus on the desired permanence of marriage. The desired permanence of marriage that is implicit in what Moses said in Genesis about a male and female becoming one flesh in marriage. And the inference from God having made them one flesh, God took the two and made them one, and the inference is that that union is not to be separated. Because God has made the two one. So the implication is permanence. Not to be separated. But the Pharisees, however, perhaps knowing or anticipating where Jesus is going, he asked him, you know, Jesus asked him, he said, look, what, Mo what did Moses command? And they smell out where he's going. And so in anticipation of that, they answer that Moses permitted divorce. You see, implying that God approved of it. And Jesus tells them, Moses allowed divorce. He allowed it as a concession to the hardness of their hearts, not as something he desired, not as his ideal. He allowed it as a concession to the hardness of their hearts. Rather, God's desire, God's ideal, as Jesus goes on to explain, is that there be no separation of the one flesh union of marriage. That's God's ideal. Now when the disciples afterward question him about that matter in the house, they come and they ask him about that. When they, when they, they question him about it in the house, Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now Mark doesn't mention, he doesn't mention the exception of, of divorce for sexual immorality that Matthew includes in the parallel. In Matthew chapter 19 verse 9, and you can see also in Matthew chapter 5 verse 32, perhaps Mark considered the exception so obvious that it didn't need to be mentioned. Maybe that's why he omits it. He thinks, of course, uh, divorce would be permitted in that exceptional case of sexual immorality. I mean, after all, it concerns it concerns sexual infidelity, which is the heart of a union according of the marital union according to Genesis. And both Roman and Jewish law, they compel divorce, a husband to divorce his wife if she was found to be in adultery. Roman and Jewish law compelled it. And it was also understood that in general rules in the Roman world, that general rules and laws contained implied exceptions. So all of those things go together to say, okay, I can understand why Mark didn't feel the need to spell out that exception. Well, then why did Matthew spell it out? You see, I understand why Mark... Well, Mark's writing to a Gentile audience. Matthew may have spelled out the exception for his Jewish readers, you see, to make it more difficult for Jewish opponents to charge Jesus with contradicting Moses. Because if you've got here among the Jews who are hostile to Christianity, this is something that is coming up from within their faith. And so he may want to cross every T, dot every I, and make sure that there's no extra room for critics to come in and say, you see what he's saying here? That's contrary to Moses. Okay, so I could understand that. I can see why Matthew would make it express and Mark would take it for granted. Okay, so, in that, so he doesn't mention that, but I wanted to touch that. Now, in teaching that divorce was not permissible, except for sexual immorality, Jesus indicated that the Shamites' understanding of Deuteronomy 24.1 essentially was correct regarding the grounds for divorce. You remember you had these two schools? 
uh, any matter or indecency, Hillelites, Shamites, a matter of indecency, which is understood to be a serious sexual sin. So Jesus is essentially saying that the Shamite's view is correct on the grounds for divorce. And in doing so, he raised the marriage stake for his disciples compared to the dominant Hillelite view. Because the Hillelite view was the one that was culturally accepted. So Jesus is raising the stakes, saying, my disciples, no, that's not how we go. Marriage was a permanent relationship in keeping with God's intention from creation with a narrow exception as a continuing concession to human fallenness. You see, with a narrow exception as a, as a continuing concession to human fallenness. Divorce always involves evil. It always involves evil. But just as Moses permitted divorce because their hearts were hard, so Jesus permits it among those with new but not yet fully transformed hearts. Right? You and I are on a journey of transformation. We won't be, our sanctification will not be completed until that day. We are being transformed into the image of Christ, but we live in the overlap of ages and our transformation is not yet complete. So here you have this, this ongoing concession. Jesus permits it among those with new but not yet fully transformed hearts, but only for sexual sin, some significant sexual activity with a person other than the spouse. In fact, Jesus went further than the Shamites. He went further than the Shamites in disallowing remarriage after divorce on impermissible grounds. As D.A. Carson comments, he says that the school of Shammai permitted remarriage when the divorce was not in accordance with its own halakha, its own rules of conduct. In other words, the Shamites, if someone of their group got a Hillelite divorce, even though that was contrary to their rules and understanding, they would still permit remarriage. And Jesus doesn't do that. So he really, in that regard, goes beyond. He basically endorses their understanding of the grounds for divorce, but he goes beyond them in that he doesn't allow remarriage after an uh, improper or uh, sinful divorce. So that's it. So, in other words, the Shamites, they permitted remarriage after Hillelite, after an any, ma any matter divorce, even though they wouldn't have granted such a divorce. Now, Mark records that Jesus addressed the issue of women divorcing. Now, that's interesting. He records that Jesus addressed the issue of women divorcing their husbands, and Jewish women, they had no legal right. They had no legal right to divorce their husbands. But there is early rabbinic material. Early rabbinic material shows a woman could compel her husband to divorce her. You see, she could compel her husband getting a Jewish court together when the husband had broken the marriage contract. She could go and say, make him divorce me. So she doesn't have a legal right of divorcing, but she did have some way of compelling him to do it, and less formally she could do it by acting so as to drive her husband to divorce her. You see, she could just become a slug, just be horrible, and then make him divorce her. So there were these options there, because when you're thinking, you're thinking, if the Jews, if only men had a legal right to divorce, why is Jesus mentioning women? And then some people will say, well, he didn't. Mark made it up. And I'm trying to get you to see, well, no. I can see Jesus addressing women in that roundabout way in a Jewish context, and I can see the Lord doing that, not only for that specific situation, but also with an eye to the spread of the gospel into the Gentile world. So he's now given this thing that is broader in his context, 
that will have immediate applicability in those social situations where women could divorce. Okay, so that's what I think is going on. That's what I think is going on now. Now, there are, of course, a number of questions and complexities surrounding the matter of divorce and remarriage. You'd have to be crazy not to know that. Okay? Because, you know, there are, there are so many permutations uh, and, and things. There's so many issues that come up. And a key issue, in my judgment, with major pastoral implications is whether the adultery of which Jesus speaks on remarriage, whether that adultery is literal or figurative. Now, that's a big issue. You see, that, that's a watershed issue because a lot of things go off on how you decide that. And so that's one of the things there. And another big issue is the church's duty toward those who have remarried sinfully. So let's say we're all on board and say, yes, that was improper. No, no basis in the will of God for having done that. But they did it. So now what is the church's response to be to that? Okay, you see, those, those are large issues. Now, I have thoughts on those things, and I have thoughts on other things. Okay, but rather than turn this into a seminar on divorce and remarriage, I refer you to my website. It's theoutlet.us. And you can go there and see what I think about some of these things on two papers, some thoughts on divorce and remarriage, and more thoughts on divorce and remarriage. So if you care what I think about it, you can look there. Now, whatever the questions and complexities, what cannot be missed is that it's the Lord's will that kingdom participants are to stay married. Kingdom participants, disciples of the Lord Jesus, are to stay married. Now, the culture breached the church's walls decades ago with its cavalier attitude about the sanctity and the permanence of marriage, leading us to wink at divorce and treat it as some kind of private, personal matter. Well, that's nobody's business but mine. Okay, we have to, we have to labor. You see, we have to labor to offer our marriages up to the Lord and to stop rationalizing and tolerating our sin in this area. Why do we get to carve that out? And just say because the society tells us it's none of your business, we are kingdom people. It is our business. You see? And so, permanence of marriage. We have to take this seriously. I know the world tells you, look, if you're unhappy, you're unfulfilled, he didn't love me, he this and that, just get a divorce. Nonsense. Nonsense. The disciple works, submits this to Jesus. The disciples grow together toward Jesus. And they change. And they don't sit here and say, well, okay, so I'm doing this wrong tough. I don't like you. I'm going to keep doing it wrong. No. No. You see, don't you see what a difference it would make if we, had our, if we offered our marriages up to the Lord in a world where this is just not done and in a world where people struggle so much with marriages? If you could offer them up to God and say, look what the Lord has done. Look how the Lord has brought us through. Look how the Lord has forged something that as I get old, I look back on and I wouldn't change for anything. The Lord has blessed me in that. Won't that have an effect? Sure it will. Thanks for coming.